thing as saying that there is a k so that the absolute value of an is less than k. Okay, you can either use this or that. Usually this is the best way to write it for bounded. Okay, because if you have this, then you know that you, your an is between minus k and k. And if you have this, you have between k1 and k2, you take the biggest absolute value of k1, k2, and you get a, a new k here. So it's really the same thing. Bounded below is only one inequality that holds, and bounded above this one. Okay, be, be sure to understand the terminology because that's important. So uh, let's go back to Bolzano reverse stress. How uh, actually it's, it's uh, a non-trivial theorem to, to prove. So it's simple and you need to memorize it. We'll use it in when we'll talk about continuous functions, for instance, and uh, the extreme value theorem. Uh, but the proof is not so easy because it's it involves some uh, uh, a little bit of uh, some some new notions that we haven't seen yet. But anyway, the, the proof I have here in the notes is avoids the, the problem of introducing more uh, terminology, uh, but it is a little mysterious on the other hand. So it's uh, really not ideal either. Anyway, so the, the proof of uh, the Boltzmann-Verge stress theorem is based on the following lemma. And the lemma says the following, any sequence has at least one monotone subsequence. So you can always extract a sequence of terms that's going to be monotone, either decreasing or increasing. And the proof of that is, uh, well, you, you, of course you can read it, and it's better, I'm not going to do it because it's the type of thing you, you need to think a little bit about it. So if you're interested, you should read it, but it's not something that we'll use, really. Uh, and the main idea is that uh, uh, you either have a sequence that jumps around forever, and in that case, you look only at the terms on one side, and that gives you something monotone, or it's uh, something that does not, that stops jumping around after a while, and therefore becomes monotone. So it's uh, an argument along these lines, but to write it uh, properly, um, you need to be careful. So we skip the proof of a lemma, and once we have the lemma, then there is basically nothing to do because. So the, the proof of uh, Boson Verstrass theorem now is quite easy because uh, let's take so assume that AN is bounded, which means that Uh, there is a k so that a n is less than k for all n. Then use the lemma to say that there is a n k a monotone subsequence. Okay, the lemma tells us that we can always find a monotone subsequence. Then we have bounded and monotone. So we don't need to be more precise than that because, because this is bounded, 
this is also going to be bounded. Okay, so we also know that a n k is less than k. I shouldn't have used k, but this is a lowercase k, and this is a capital K. So a n k is less than k for all k. When you take a subsequence, now the running index is k, is not n anymore. So um, a and k is bounded, and here you have two possibilities. Either your subsequence is increasing or it's decreasing, but in any case, uh, this uh, uh, inequality here tells us that this subsequence is bounded below and above, so we don't really care whether it's increasing or decreasing in this particular case. And therefore, monotone plus bounded implies convergence. Questions? Okay, do you see why we don't need to, to know more than monotone in this case? Yes? So monotone is bounded for a convergence Correct. So, uh, yes, so A and K converges. Okay, which is what we wanted, right? Bozano Verstrass tells us there is a subsequence that converges. Now, once you have one, you can have as many as you want because um, you could take a sub subsequence of this one. That's a new subsequence that's also going to converge. So once you have one, you have many, you have infinitely many. Okay. Now, uh, for instance, uh, an easy application on that. An example, let AN be a sequence in zero one. Then AN has a subsequence that converges. You see that we get the existence of a subsequence. We don't know how to find the subsequence. Okay, so uh, the argument is going to be useful when we only need to know that some subsequence converges without caring about what the limit is and what the subsequence is. It's not going to be useful if we need to be more precise than that. So how do we prove that? Well, of course, a n is between 0 and 1. So a n is bounded. And if it's bounded by Bolzan Verstras, there is a subsequence a and k that converges. So that would, uh, yes, that's, uh, that implies that it converges in 0, 1, and, but that's something we're going to see next. But if we, so we know that A and K converges, and we know that it co it's always between 0 and 1, because the whole sequence is between 0 and 1. So this is converging to some L, and as we are going to see next, the, in the limit, the inequalities stay the same. 
Okay, that's also part of a question in your homework. Uh, so we're going to state a result like this, which says that if a sequence is smaller than another one, and they both converge, then the limits are in the same order, but all with large inequalities. And your homework uh, for Thursday, you have a question asking whether if I start here with a strict inequality, I end up with a strict inequality. And the answer to that is no. Okay, there are examples where this is strictly lower than that, but the limits are the same. Okay, so you, you have to come up with a counterexample there. So, uh, in, your, um, in your notes here, um, it says it converges. It doesn't specify, uh, it has a subsequence that converges. Uh, in the example, uh, or yeah, is it? Page 50, uh, example 2, down at the end of it, right before the operations on limits. So show that if an is a sequence in 0, 1, then it has a subsequence that converges. Right, and it says hence, uh, down here, hence an is bounded and by... Oh, 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 oh. Converges. thank you. Yeah, that's a mistake. So operations on limits... So we are assuming that AN converges to A and BN converges to B. Then uh, we have several statements. AN plus BN converges to A plus B. A and BN converges to AB. And if Bn is not zero for all n, and B is not zero, then An over Bn converges to A over B. If I assume that Bn is not zero for all n, do I also need to assume that the limit B is non-zero? Or is this implied that by the fact that Bn is different from zero for all n? Is it implied? It's not implied, of course. One over n is never zero, but it converges to zero. So you, need, you do need to say something about what your limit is. And fourth property, the one I, I was just talking about. If an is less than bn, and here it's, okay, it's not that important uh, uh, to have a large inequality or not, then a is less than b, and here it's important, because you, you cannot say something more, you cannot restrict this inequality. It's going to be a large inequality in general. Okay, even if you have a strict inequality here. So these are the operations you can do, and of course, then it's, uh, uh, it's quite useful because you can construct new sequences that converge because you have pieces that converge, like AN converges and BN converges, then uh, AN plus BN converges. And you can use these to prove the first homework thing there. Right. Which one? We can say that a constant is basically just another sequence that converges automatically. Yes. Very good, yeah. Uh, here, this includes also the case where one of the two sequences is a constant. Okay? So if Bn is a constant, C, it, this is telling me that A and C goes to AC, provided A and converges to A. So this includes uh, that case as well. Now, proof, uh, we're going to prove some of those. 
And uh, here the, the technique of proof is interesting. So what we'd like, what we'd like is end up, so this is my scratch paper, not the formal proof yet. What we'd like is end, end up with something like this. Okay, that's our end point. Now, how do we get there? Well, one way to do that would be to say a n plus b n minus a plus b is less than, well, let's rewrite first. This has the difference. a n minus a plus b n minus b which is a n minus a plus b n minus b. By the triangle inequality. Uh, s some of you have uh, uh, used uh, the squeezing principle uh, in one problem in the previous homework, but this has nothing to do with the squeezing principle. This is just the triangle inequality. Squeezing principle is when you let uh, two limits on both Okay, when you have three sequences, a n less than b n less than c n, and these two converge to the same limit, and then you say that b n converges to the same limit. Okay, that's what the squeezing principle is, not this. Okay, so uh, we do this. And then to get our epsilon, we say, well, we could make this small and this small because we know that an converges to a and bn converges to b. That's our hypothesis. So this could be made smaller than epsilon over 2, and this one also, and we, we would end up with epsilon, which is what we want. Okay? So this is our strategy. That's not the proof. Now let's write down the proof, now that we have seen what we are going to do. So now we say the following. Uh, first thing we are going to need that this is more than epsilon over 2. So we say that for every epsilon, there exists an n, so that if n is bigger than n, then a n minus a is less than epsilon over 2. Epsilon over 2 is a legitimate epsilon because it's strictly positive. Okay, I don't care how I call it. If it's strictly positive, I can do that. Same thing for b n. Of course, there is no reason that the capital N be the same. So you take n1 here uh, and 2 here. There is some n, but not necessarily the same. Now, as always, you define n to be the maximum of n1 and n2. You don't know which one is the biggest one. You don't know what the sequences are. But you know there is a, one of the two is bigger than the other, and that's what you call capital N. Now, if n is bigger than capital N, then n is bigger than n1, and n is bigger than n2, so the two inequalities are true. And now, so you take n larger than to n, and you do a n plus b n minus a plus b, which is a n minus a plus b n minus b, which is less than a n minus a plus b n minus b, which is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 which is absolute. Why do you need the max of the two ends again? I, I need the max because I, I want to make sure that these two inequalities are hold true. If I, if I uh, uh, took just n bigger than n1, then 
this may be true, but this may not be true because I don't, maybe n1 is smaller than n2 and my n is not big enough for this second inequality to be true. That's the issue. So that proves it. Now be careful in the homework for Thursday, you have a little bit of a, a reverse question, which is that uh, in that case, I think it's an minus bn. An minus bn or an plus bn. Let's assume that an plus bn converges to something. You know the sum converges. You cannot use this argument. And it's not a true statement. Then, then an converges and bn converges. Maybe when you do the sum, you get convergence. But it doesn't mean that each piece converges. Okay, and the proof breaks down because the triangular inequality goes this way only, and that's uh, what you need. I mean, uh, you would need to reverse your inequality if you wanted to prove that uh, this is small if this is small. Okay, so that's not working. Yeah. Can we just go ahead and use these four? Absolutely. So we yeah. say you know we have our constant you know minus one and. Use the multiplication one and then hmm. add it to one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So that was for the first one. And they are all basically on the same pattern, but the algebra gets worse uh, for uh, the product, for the ratio, and so on. So let me just say a word about it, but I'm not really going to do it. Um, so we can. So let me give you, for instance, the idea for 2i. Uh, for 2i, you would have a n b n minus a b. This is a thing that needs to be small. And again, the information you have is about a n minus a and b n minus b. So that's what you try to introduce here. So let's see what do we have. Uh, we need to subtract a n b. So a n b n. So what did I do here? Yeah, we write it. No, it's actually better to write it this way. Okay. So uh, I start by writing a n b n, which is this thing here, and then I have minus b because I want b n minus b. But this term I don't have here, so I not I need to add it. It's a n b, and then I need this term as well minus a b. Do okay, you see what I did? I just introduced a term here, which is minus a and b. I add this term so that it disappears. And then I copy my minus a b, which is here. So then we rewrite this as a n b n minus b plus b a n minus a. And then we use the triangle inequality because now we're in good shape. Well, at least we have a bn minus b, and we know that this is small. And we have an minus a, and we know this is small too. So we end up with an bn minus b plus b an minus a.
so um, what type of epsilon should I put here for a n minus a so that he, the, this whole thing here becomes epsilon over 2? What should I do? Epsilon over 2b. Okay? So what I could do here is say uh, there is an n1, so for every epsilon, there is an n1 so that an minus a is less than epsilon over 2b in absolute value. Okay, we want a positive epsilon, of course. So we take this as our epsilon. Oh, and there is a case b equals 0, which is treated differently. Let's, let's assume that b is not 0 here. Otherwise, we will be. It's easier when b is 0. So we get 1 inequality for this. And you see why we do this. When we multiply by b, we are going to end up with epsilon over 2, which is what we want. Now, what do you suggest for this term here? What epsilon should I take? Epsilon over 2a. 2a? But a, but a, uh, here I have an, I don't have a. Is this a problem? Yes. It is definitely a problem. Okay? I cannot take an epsilon which is moving with my n. Never. So I'm, I cannot say I'm going to take epsilon over 2 a n. So what can I do? Well, we know that a n is bounded. Very good. a n is bounded. So let's do another step here and replace our a n by its bound k times bn minus b plus the same thing here, b times an minus a. Why do I know an is bounded? Because it converges. And now I'm in good shape because my epsilon could definitely be epsilon over 2k. I have no n anymore. Okay? So now we would write the reason 2 so that bn minus b is less than epsilon over 2k. Then you write your proof in the right order. <coughs> now you know what to do. You start with this part. You define your n as being the maximum of n1 and 2 and you do this manipulation next. And you end up with epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is epsilon. Okay, but that's where well, it's important to, to, to be able to write it formally. But the, the idea is here. And that's what you need to understand. Questions? So a n over b n is even more amusing because there you have to deal with uh, the fact that uh, you have a denominator and uh, you somehow you want to show that you are bounded away from zero. Okay? Uh, it's the same problem as here. You are going to have a term that is going to depend on n, but worse than that, it's also a term that uh, is, uh, may possibly not be defined. So you, you need to, to do some work to show that you have some type of constant exactly in the same way. Okay? So have a look at it. It's uh, instructive. But I'm not going to do it. Uh, so that's for 3i. Now, what I'd like to do is 4i. So, for 4, we, we assume that an converges to a, that bn converges to b, and that an is less than bn for on.
And we want to conclude that A is less than B. Okay, that's what uh, 4 tells us. Now, in order to do that, let's do a proof by contradiction. What's the contradiction of A less than or equal to B? A strictly greater than B. As always, let's draw a line and let's assume that B is here and A is here. We can pick an epsilon here so that our BN are in here for N large enough. Okay, we can, that's the definition of converging to B. And then we can pick uh, another epsilon so that these two intervals do not overlap and AN is here. Do you see what the contradiction is? What it is? Yeah, you end up with BN strictly less than AN which is contradicting your hypothesis. So, now that we have the picture, we, we know what, uh, in which direction we should work. What do you suggest for my epsilon, for this picture to be true? And don't say half. Well, yeah, so, so, okay, so what you want is, let's say, and there are many choices, let's say that you want that this point be B plus A over 2. But that's also the point epsilon plus B, B plus epsilon. So, epsilon is A minus B over 2. if we solve for epsilon. Is this a legitimate epsilon? Yes. It is because we are assuming that A is strictly bigger than B and therefore our epsilon is strictly positive. Okay? And uh, if we do that, uh, well, actually, the two points are going to be the same, but because we have strict inequalities, that's not a problem. Uh, what's going to happen is that uh, we, you see, if we do that, this here would be A minus epsilon. So if we do A minus epsilon, with this epsilon, we get A minus A minus B over 2, which is A plus B over 2. So in the picture, uh, well, with this choice of epsilon, we get B plus epsilon here, and we get A minus epsilon uh, at the same point. They are both the same. That's fine, because when we write our definition of convergence, we have strict inequalities. So now, let's write things up. we are going to say the following, that for take epsilon equal to a minus b over 2, there exists an n so that a n minus a is strictly less than epsilon for n larger than n1, which is the same as saying that a n is bigger than a a minus epsilon and smaller than A plus epsilon. And really what's of interest to us is this 
inequality here, a minus epsilon, according to our computation here, is a plus b over 2. So a n is bigger than a plus b over 2 for n bigger than n1. Now we do the same thing for uh, bn. We exist n2, so that bn minus b is less than epsilon for n larger than n2, which means that bn is between b minus epsilon and b plus epsilon. And uh, b plus epsilon, that's how we found our epsilon, is a plus b over 2 again. So now we, we take n to be bigger than the maximum of n1 and n2. And uh, we get that the a n is bigger than a plus b over 2. b n is smaller than a plus b over 2. So a n is strictly bigger than b n for n bigger than n2. So this tells me, this gives me the contradiction. I, I, my hypothesis is a n is less than or equal to b n. start by drawing a picture to know where you are going, how you are going to pick your epsilon. Okay, that's um, the first step. Okay. So for instance, for example, if a n converges to a and a n belongs to 0, 1 for all n, then uh, a must belong to 0, 1 as well. Okay, so the way you do that the way you do that is because uh, an is between 0 and 1 and by 4, what we just did, this becomes 0. It's for constant sequence uh, 0. And this goes to A. And same thing on this side. This goes to 1. So that's why we know that A is between 0 and 1. This actually gives another proof of the squeezing principle. Did you see why? Uh, 
so it, it gives another proof because you have a n squeezed between b n and c n, and you know that uh, uh, we all know it doesn't actually. What's missing to 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 prove a squeezing principle? I'm sorry. No. Okay. So let let's uh, let's assume that a n converges to a. And let's con assume that Cn converges to A. And let's assume that Bn is between An and Cn. OK, that's, these are the hypotheses of the squeezing principle. So can I say that uh, A is less than B, for instance, using uh, 4? Why not? The difficulty here is that I don't know that Bn converges. So the, the, print, the four inequality does not apply. And that's why we do need the squeezing principle. Because it tells us that Bn converges. And if we knew that Bn converges, then yes, it would work. We would have A less than B less than A. So A and B must be the same thing. Do you see what's missing? I'm not always sure it's a good strategy to show you mistakes, but yeah, next example, assume that AN converges and that you know, what do we have? AN plus BN converges as well. then Bn converges. So what you cannot do, another mistake, so don't write it, what you cannot do is say, well, limit of An plus Bn is limit of An plus limit of Bn, because that's what I says. Why is this not what I says? Yes, you don't know that Bn converges. So this does not hold until you show that An and Bn converge. An you know, but Bn you don't. Okay? So don't do that. We can, yes, but not the way I, I wrote it. So what do you suggest? Uh, something from page 52. <laughs> Reading page 52 is not uh, allowed to answer to, to a question. Now, what you want to do is to express Bn as a simple operation of two sequences that do converge, and then use the principle. So you write that Bn is, for instance, An plus Bn minus An. OK, that's a true statement. And the advantage of this is that you know that An plus Bn converges. That's your hypothesis. And you know that An converges. So now you are doing the difference of two convergent sequences. You know the difference converges. Okay, so An plus Bn converges to some limit L1. An converges to some L2. And therefore, uh, Bn must converge to L1 minus L2. And we can just, we can do that. We can say, you know, if we take the limit of this equation, we know that. Well, you're using operations on limits. So I'm, I'm going a little fast here, but what you're doing really is looking at An plus Bn plus minus An. And then you use the first property 
that tells you that it must converge to the sum. And minus An must converge to minus L2 because An converges to L2, and that's the product. Okay, so it's uh, just operations on limits that you are using here. But you can do it directly. And if you have two sequences and the, the, that converge, then the difference converges to the difference of the limits. Questions? So uh, let's see, last uh, example. <coughs> and that is needed for uh, the proof that the ratio of, a, of two convergent sequences converges to the ratio of the limits is the following one. What we'd like to show is that <coughs> so if Bn is different from zero and Bn converges to B, and B is different from zero. <coughs> then one over, uh, <coughs> so what we need here is one over B and B, is bound or 1 over Bn is not, let's <coughs> Okay, so we are assuming that Bn is different from 0. We are assuming that it converges to a limit which is different from 0. So the sequence 1 over Bn is well defined. We are not dividing by 0 at any point. And uh, we'd like to show that this is bounded. Of course, we, uh, before using the result that 1 over Bn converges to 1 over B, because in that case, there is nothing to do. So let's assume we don't know that yet. And we just want to show that 1 over Bn is bounded. Well, the way we would do that is, of course, we, the only thing at our disposal is uh, uh, the definition of uh, uh, convergence. So what we would uh, do is write some triangle inequalities. get this, that uh, uh, Bn is larger than B minus B minus Bn. Okay, the usual trick 
uh, of introducing a term and subtracting a term. This is useful because it gives me a lower bound on the absolute value of Bn. And what I need is an upper bound on the inverse. So this, is, this goes in the right direction. Now, how do I know that this thing here is bounded away from zero? Okay, I want a number. I, I, I don't want ends running around. So how, the, I have two problems at this point. I want to get rid of the n. And I want to get, uh, so I want to find a lower bound here, which with no n. And which is strictly positive because I want to take the inverses. So how do I do that? What do you think of b minus bn? Is this a small term or large one? Is it something we can control? It's small. Okay, bn converges to b. So we are going to pick an epsilon. And this thing is going to be bigger than b minus epsilon. Bigger because we, we have a minus in front of it. So we are reversing the inequality. So for instance, we could pick epsilon equal to absolute value of b over 2. Because I need to compare it to absolute value of b. That's why I need to take something which relates to absolute value of b. And then, as usual, there exists an n. So that if n is bigger than capital N, then uh, b minus bn is less than b over 2. Then I multiply by minus 1 uh, both sides, and I get minus b minus bn bigger than minus b over 2. And then I add b on both sides. And I end up with b over 2. So for n bigger than capital N, we have bn bigger than b minus b minus bn, which we just showed is bigger than b over 2. Now these are uh, positive terms, and I know that the inverse function is decreasing on real positives. So I take inverses on both sides, and I say that this is actually strictly, because this is strict, 1 over b over 2, which is 2 over b. Okay, so we have a bound we have shown that 1 over bn, this bound is true for n larger than capital N. But as always, we uh, then say there are only finitely many terms that are not included here, okay? because it's only the first capital N. And I know I have a maximum of these uh, 1 over bn, and therefore the whole thing now is bound. Okay? So maybe we should write it. We, we should uh, say the following, that let uh, b be the maximum of the first n terms, which are going to be 1 over b1, 1 over b2, 1 over bn. That's a well-defined quantity. I'm looking at finitely many numbers and taking the biggest one of them. Then uh, from this, I can say the following, that 1 over bn is less than uh, the maximum of b and 
2 over b. I don't know which one is bigger. But certainly this is less than that. And now this is true for all n. Okay, so that's always how you get rid of finitely many terms. You, you can always take the maximum. That you cannot do for infinitely many terms because you don't know what happens. Maybe the maximum exists, maybe it doesn't. And certainly, uh, if you're looking at the maximum of infinitely many terms, it may very well be infinite because you are taking things bigger and bigger and you, then you don't stop. So, okay, just try to take the maximum of the naturals. You, you don't get one. Questions? Okay, so let's stop here for today.